Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body. They saw the angel sitting there and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire. That a man had risen from the dead. That he was alive. That death could not hold him. He's a living Savior. Christ is alive. Well, good morning. Welcome. You've joined the online service of Lansdowne Church on the most joyful morning of the entire year. This is Easter Sunday, the morning when we celebrate that Jesus is risen from the dead. And now we're going to sing together and celebrate that great truth. He is alive. Let's sing together. See what a morning.
morning, I'm Angelina Linden, the children and families worker here at Lansdowne Church and I wanted to share with you how we are connecting with children and families in this new and different season. Discipleship is really important to us as a church and so I'll be talking about some of the ways that we are continuing to disciple our children and families that we reach. Firstly, on a Monday we have been running our Mums Bible Study online through Zoom. We have been sharing together, sharing the word and praying for one another and this has been a real encouragement to our families. On a Wednesday and Thursday we normally run our Jelly Tots and so we have been posting up videos online of a Jelly Tots story and song time and engaging the children in crafts and activities. On a Friday morning, we are excited to launch our Lansdowne Kids Parent Prayer Line where families can engage with us, share with us and we can pray and encourage one another. On a Friday evening, we normally run our High Five group and so we have been sending out activity sheets where the children can engage in crafts, activities and games. We have also been providing a message each week and a prayer that they can engage with. On a Sunday, we've really been encouraging our children and families to engage together in our Lansdowne Live service. We have been posting up activity sheets to really help the children engage in the service and it has been great seeing some of the children's creations. After the services on a Sunday, we have been posting up videos for our Lansdowne Kids groups so that they can continue to engage in the Lansdowne Kids big Bible curriculum. And so if you are a family and you are not engaging with us yet, we encourage you to. I encourage you to join our Lansdowne Kids Facebook page if you are on Facebook or you can drop me an email on angelina.linden at lansdownechurch.uk. I would love to hear from you and know how I can support and encourage you as a family. So next, we are going to hear from one of our Lansdowne Kids families and we are going to hear about how they have been encouraging their children to engage in relationship with God in this season. Hi Jenny, it's great to chat to you and your family over Zoom this morning. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the ways in which you are helping your family to engage with God in this season. So first of all, can you introduce your family to us? Hi, I'm Jenny. This is my older son, Alex. Hello. And this is my younger son, Dylan. Hello. Okay, so first of all, how are you as a family connecting into church on Sundays? Well, every Sunday morning after breakfast, we've started to introduce groundbreakers at home. So this past Sunday, we did Palm Sunday, and it was great to be able to use the activities from the Lansdowne Kids page and to be able to watch you doing Sunday school for us, which was brilliant. And we were able to join in with the songs and the memory verse, and we had a Bible story. And what did we make, boys? It was Palm we Sunday. Made these wow, so I love Palm Palm, palm leaves and then we went on to make uh, models from Lego and we were so inspired by the Palm Sunday models that we decided to do the whole of Holy Week. So what have you got there, I, I did Jesus down on the cross and all the people. And what about you, Dylan? What did you do? Um, I shared the Last Supper. Wow, they are such lovely models. Well done, boys. Brilliant. Okay, so how are you and your children engaging in the Lansdowne Kids activities that we are putting out there for you? So Friday night has become a high five at home night. So again, there's the high five Facebook page, which has been brilliant. We've got activities that we can get involved in. It, there are things that we can pray about. And it just helps to keep connected. So what was the activity last Friday? So Excellent. That's so great that you're able to still connect into what High Five are doing at home. Um, so next, what are some of the ways that you are providing activities for your children to grow in relationship with God in this season? Well, we've been thinking 
about Holy Week. And we start each day with um, our resurrection eggs. So these have been really helpful to focus us. And so each day you've got a different item inside the egg. So we've got the stone, for example, that was across the Jesus tomb. And we're able to talk about these eggs and actually refocus on the real meaning of Easter because normally as a family, we'd be racing around to Lowell Castle, doing Easter egg hunts or going to football matches. And actually this year, we've been able to think more about Jesus in a different way because we've had that time and we've been able to start each day with prayer as well. So these are our prayer hands. We found this incredibly helpful to be able to put the names of people that were, and situations that we're praying for into God's hands because it can feel really overwhelming at the moment with all that's going on with the coronavirus. And knowing that we've got God in control has really helped us as a family. And we feel that we can actually completely trust as we pray that um, God is going to hear and answer our prayers. That's really great. You're really focusing the children and your family on the real message of Easter and also really encouraging how you're using this opportunity to really be praying for other people that maybe are suffering at this time. Um, and last of all, how are you engaging with families in the church? What's your favourite way, Alice? So we, I've been face, me and Dylan have been FaceTiming our friends from church and from school that we've been missing. Wonderful. And we we um, were encouraged to make Easter invitations for the Easter Sunday service and to be able to post those through people's doors. So we had great fun doing that with our friends. And um, Dylan, what did we do yesterday? Well, um, we um, went round, round it and sent people's houses to have a go to our church. And we um, delivered some pebbles and put them at their doors. So we were able to paint rainbows on the pebbles and then to put Bible verses on there to encourage them. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing with us today and for your family sharing with us too. And just know that we will be keeping you in our prayers and we'll be praying that God's blessing will be on you as you share his message to others in this season. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Isn't it great to hear about how kids are hearing the gospel and connecting with it, even at these difficult times? And now we're going to do the same. We're going to open the Bible and hear this good news as we hear the account of Jesus risen from the dead. So turn with me to Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 15, and we're going to start reading at verse 42. So this is Mark 15, verse 42. It was the preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. 
As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Incredible news, good news, Jesus is alive. And now Julie is going to sing to us a song that reminds us of this story and helps us to reflect on it. So um, do enjoy this as Julie sings Glorious Day.
Before we sing again together, shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you this Easter Sunday that Jesus is alive. And we declare that that truth changes everything. Because the, the stone was rolled away, the, the tomb was empty, because Jesus has conquered death. Everything changes. We've seen this to be true this week on, on Tuesday when we celebrated together as a church the life of Kerry Brown. We thank you that for her, death is not the end. And because she trusted Jesus, she has hope that she has life in him. And Lord, we are amazed. We are blown away. We are filled with deep joy that one day together with Kerry, we will be given new resurrection bodies in a new creation a world made right by the power of Jesus, no longer marred by sin or by disease or by death. Father, this truly is the kind of hope that our world needs. So we pray, Father, for our world at this time, when we're so aware of sickness, when we're so aware of our own um, mortality, we're so aware of the, the brevity of things. And yet, Father, thank you that in Christ we have a hope to share. And please give us boldness to share wherever we have opportunity this week. And now, Lord, as your people, as we sing again in just a moment, as, as Peter opens the scriptures to us in a few minutes' time, would you expand and extend our faith? Would you help us to trust you more with our own uncertainties, with our own fears and anxieties? Help us to trust in the God who raises the dead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue now and sing together. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. Let's sing.
Those multi-screen music compilations are amazing, aren't they? I mean, how do they do it? Genius, I say. Uh, I don't know where to look without going cross-eyed. I reckon Martin Grisdale has at least four hands and has superpowers to be in more than one place at the same time. We're, we're so grateful to Martin and, and Lucy for the camera work and the, and the video editing, to, to Ness and Julie, to all our, our music makers, and of course to Stephen Gatehouse for that brilliant uh, a video that began the service this morning. We are so blessed as a church with all this creative and technical talent, and it's coming to fresh expressions during these, uh, these strange times in, in, which, in which we're living. We, we, we thank God, don't we, for each other, and uh, we're looking forward, I'm sure we are, to that occasion. It's going to be quite an occasion when we're all able to get back together again in the same space at the same time. I can't wait to shake a hand, to hug someone, to, uh, to have actually someone across from me who I can speak to face to face. This, this on-screen stuff is, is, is fine up to a point, but it's, it's no substitute for the real thing. Uh, true worship, like, uh, like true human existence, is, is really embodied existence. It's flesh and blood reality, which brings me today to my message and the resurrection of Jesus. For that was physical. It wasn't digital or virtual. A real body was nailed to the tree on Good Friday. A real body was laid in the tomb and a real body emerged triumphant from the grave three days later. Jesus didn't appear on a computer screen to his disciples. Here's how John, in his gospel account, described one of those many appearances of Jesus. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord with the doors locked. Did you hear that? Sounds familiar? You bet it does, because right now the whole world is, is locked in and locked down. That's never been a problem for Jesus. And it's not now. He's alive, breaking down doors, crossing frontiers, opening hearts and minds to his truth, giving socially isolated people his peace. The BBC News website carried a, a, a headline uh, just the other day. Christians face Easter with a virus lockdown. But we're not the first Christian community to be locked in. That's how this whole thing began, behind closed doors. But of course it didn't stay indoors. How could it? The truth of Jesus had to get out. The tomb couldn't hold him, so there's no way the disciples would keep quiet about him. Christianity talks. That's how it grows. Christians have got something. No, they've got someone utterly unique to talk about. The death defier, the virus beater, the peace offerer, the sin forgiver, the hope restorer. That is a powerful message. And with that message, the early church, from its closed in, locked down position, took on the world and transformed it changed it because Christianity offers a compelling answer to two questions. Here they are. What happens when we die? And is there a future for our world? The distinctive hope of the Christian faith is that Christ's death and resurrection redeems the whole of creation, not just human beings, not just our souls, but our bodies and nature too, the animal world, the planets, the stars, the seas. So if the resurrection of Jesus was just figurative and spiritual, not physical, then, then Jesus is just, just a memory kept alive by our, our worship songs. If there was no bodily resurrection of Jesus, 
death and coronavirus is still in charge of the world. But friends, Jesus is alive. In the words of the mysterious figure to the women who turned up at the tomb of Jesus, expecting to find his body inside that tomb, he has risen. He's not here. That is the greatest news headline ever, covering the greatest event in history. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Happy Easter. Now, I should be standing to preach that, not sitting. Despite everything that appears completely broken and scary in our world right now, it's still Happy Easter. You may have been trapped indoors for the last month or so. Your only conversations may have been with people on a screen or, or on a phone. It's still for you. Happy Easter. Look, here's the Easter egg that, uh, that I, I bought for Sean. You see, and uh, here's the bigger one that I, uh, that, that, no, no, this, this is the one that I bought for Sean. It's bigger than the littler one that, that Sean, much more I love Sean than she does me. But to say that these things nowadays are as cheap as chips. I mean, th that was 75% discount, the, the Thorntons one. You can get uh, three for the price of one in supermarkets uh, right now. It's just amazing how cheap chocolate is. Of course, you can't get, you can't get uh, hand sanitizer, antibacterial stuff for love nor money nowadays. It's been nearly a month and I'm still waiting for the Tesco Express in Westbourne to replenish their stock. Now, all that tells me something that we're having to rethink what really matters in life. You see, when, when, when the world is fighting coronavirus, Cadbury's, Cadbury's, cho Cadbury's chocolate is, is not particularly something of a necessity. It, it's a luxury. What was maybe really important a month ago, that doesn't seem to be as, as crucial now. In a crisis, our values change. And so Easter eggs are, are hardly a matter of life and death. Of course, there are some things that are a matter of life and death, like intensive care ventilators, like PPE, personal protective equipment. Those things matter. And the most important thing of all that matters is the answer to the question did Jesus rise from the dead? So I want to try and answer that question with you today by walking through the evidence for the resurrection suggested by those verses that we read just now from the Gospel of Mark. You see, around the big story of the empty tomb, Mark places three very human stories. The first concerns this man called Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, writes Mark, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. The thing, of course, about Joseph of Arimathea is that he was a well-known public figure, a member of the prominent Sanhedrin, the leading Jewish council. So this was a pretty brave move on his part to ask Pilate's permission to take care of Jesus' funeral arrangements. Matthew suggests in his gospel, by the way, that up until this point, Joseph of Arimathea had been a, a kind of secret disciple of Jesus. There are many people in our world today, aren't there, who for good reason have to operate below the radar, incognito as believers, to protect their families. That is not, I think, the case for the majority of us here in the West. We, we are not so much secret disciples as silent disciples. One of the reasons I suggest for the lack of growth of the Christian church in the last two generations is that here in the UK, too many Christians have stopped talking about Jesus. We struggle, don't we, to speak up in public. Our work colleagues don't really know why we go to church, but we can't stay a silent disciple of Jesus forever. 
Not if this gospel is true. Not if the resurrection is a reality. So Joseph goes boldly to Pilate. There, there comes a point in everyone's Christian life when we must self-identify. When professional reputation, embarrassment, whatever it is, has to be faced. When we've got to be willing to say, yes, I'm with Jesus. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as, as, it, as it was here for Joseph, but it has to be as real as it was for him and maybe as costly. The thing about Joseph's actions is that he supplies us with two vital clues to support the reliability uh, of the resurrection account. Number one, he asks Pilate for the dead body of Jesus. Pilate's actually surprised with that request. Roman crucifixion was so barbaric that sometimes victims would hang there for day after day before they actually died. So Pilate has to make sure that Jesus was dead. Mark observes, when Pilate learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Yeah, Jesus was dead. Roman soldiers were very good at their job. The body of Jesus was lifeless. And that lifeless body was handed over to Joseph. Now, Mark makes a lot of this little detail. And I'm glad he does. Because one of the theories which seeks to discredit the truth of the resurrection is that it wasn't Jesus who died on the cross, but someone else. He had a, a, a body double. Jesus swooned on the cross. He didn't die. And eventually... Uh, he, he recovered somewhere in Jerusalem and then managed eventually to persuade his disciples that he was the king of death, that he'd beaten death. No, this was the same Jesus, the same body, and he was dead. The other way that Joseph's story supports the evidence for the resurrection is that Joseph places the body of Jesus in a known tomb because he was a, a wealthy member of the aristocracy, the family vault of Joseph of Arimathea would have been a thing of public record. And so Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb, cut out of the rock. Joseph makes very sure, in other words, that the tomb of Jesus would be sealed and that the body of Jesus was secure in his vault. So they roll a huge stone across the entrance. Now, in his gospel, Matthew comments that the Jewish authorities arranged at this point for a special guard of soldiers to be placed outside. Not, of course, to stop anyone getting out of that tomb, but to prevent someone going in. No one expected the resurrection. So, so why, why the fuss about the tomb? Well, for these reasons, uh, some dismiss the resurrection of Jesus by saying that the ladies the following morning went to the wrong tomb. Well, listen to verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. And here comes the second story, the story of the women. They'd been watching Joseph and the burial proceedings very closely. So when they turn up the following morning to finish the job of embalming the body of Jesus, they knew exactly where they were going. They had only one concern that day. Who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? That was their priority. They were there to execute a burial plan. They were not there to organize a resurrection party. Resurrection was the last thing on their mind. And there's another one of those bits of evidence for us that adds a ring of truth to, to the account. It crops up again and again in the New Testament narrative during this first Easter day. To begin with, all the followers of Jesus seem so slow to work out what's going on and even slower to believe it. The women didn't need to worry about moving the stone. It had already been rolled away. So as they enter the tomb, they get a message from this person dressed in white, presumably an angel. 
Don't worry, says the angel, Jesus has risen. Now go and tell the disciples, especially Peter. But what do the women do? They do the exact opposite of what they are told to do. They tell no one, at least not at first. And Mark finishes his account, his gospel, with these words. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I love that. It's so real, so human, so authentic. The women feel the exact opposite of what they are told to feel, and they do the exact opposite of what they're told to do. Don't be scared. They were. Tell people about Jesus. They don't. I'll come back to why I think Mark ends the way he does. Just pick up that little detail about the third human story. Go tell his disciples and Peter. That is so very poignant. Why does Peter get such a big mention? Because he'd made such a big mess. A few days before, you remember, Peter had denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. He was a broken man because of that. He'd not lived up to his own hype. Oh, Jesus, I'll not let you down. I'm your man. And then the cock crowed and Peter wept. What grace, what restoring love of Jesus to get the message to Peter. Tell my disciples and Peter, I'm going to see them in Galilee. Failure never need be final. Have you messed up? Have you promised more to God than you've delivered? Of course, we all have. The truth of the resurrection is ultimately transforming. Jesus comes to us in our failure, our disbelief and our doubt and despair. He meets us through the tears of grief and disappointment that we may have shed over our selfishness and sin. Do you know what? The truth of the resurrection doesn't always dawn upon people who get it straight away. It comes to those who in some cases stumble across it, who are surprised by it, who come to see Jesus through their own sorrow and, and failure and fear. People who understand who Jesus is through their own tears. The silent disciples who aren't brave enough to say, hey, I'm with Jesus. Those who feel and do exactly the opposite of what they're told to feel and do. And the ultimate truth of the resurrection is that we catch sight of the fact that even beyond the grave, there is a stone that has been rolled away. And the one who, who loves us beyond our imagination, is waiting to lead us into a future filled by the possibilities of his grace. A world that will be forever without tears and death and disease. A new world of flesh and blood reality. Embodied existence in which righteousness and justice reigns forever. So as I wrap up, let me say this. The truth of the resurrection of Jesus matters for two very big reasons. Number one, because it tells us that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus made many startling claims while he was on earth. He claimed, for example, that he could forgive sin. He claimed to be the light of the world. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He claimed to be the Son of God. All of those claims mean absolutely nothing if Jesus' claim to be the resurrection and the life is a hoax. Everything that Jesus says Everything about him stands or falls on that truth. 
Why should we, why should anyone believe his claim to forgive sin, his claim to be the son of God, if his claim to defeat death is a fraud? We can forget the ethics of Jesus and the morality of Jesus if that central claim is false. But it's not. He rose from the dead, triumphant over every enemy. The second reason that the resurrection of Jesus matters is that because it tells us that there is an answer to death, that there is hope for our world. That world which we experience right now as teetering on the very edge of collapse as never before in our lifetime. We are facing today our mortality. The breakdown of so much that we've built our lives upon, that we've built our dreams upon. Suddenly those things don't seem so secure and certain anymore. The spread of COVID-19 is having a far greater health impact than Ebola and SARS before it. It's having a far greater financial and economic impact than the global crisis of 2008. And potentially, it's having a greater cultural, emotional and psychological impact than massive tragedies like 9-11 or the Boxing Day tsunami. In social isolation, in loss of employment, in the facing of mass burials, people are struggling to find their foundations. With only four ventilators for 11 million people in the whole of South Sudan, our world needs something a little bit more than pictures of pretty rainbows in windows. Our world needs real hope, a different vision of the future. The foundation on which you build your life is the only thing that will stand when the storms of life ultimately come. And friends, they will come. It's not a question of if they come, but when they come. And only the good news of Jesus Christ is strong enough for that storm. Only the person of Jesus is powerful enough to save us from that storm. Only the resurrection of Jesus can guarantee a future for humanity and for the cosmos. It's that vision of the future which drives and inspires those who believe in Jesus into the world today to make a difference. I mentioned just now the curious, almost unfinished end to Mark's gospel with the women left trembling and, and bewildered and, and afraid. Do you know, I believe that was Mark's intention. I believe that Mark writes in the way he does because he's inviting us, the readers of his gospel, and those especially who believe in the risen Christ and believe his good news, to become part of the ongoing story to go and tell the gospel of resurrection and hope for a new creation. Yeah, there is an unfinished gospel. It's not Marx. It's over to us now to continue the story, to take the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth, or at least to the ends of Boscombe or Christchurch or Bournemouth or Poole. What's that story? The story of a God who entered a world infected with a virus more contagious and more deadly than COVID-19. This virus the Bible calls sin. The God who in Jesus lived among sick people, not wearing a, a chemical protective suit, but breathing the same air as we do, eating the same food as we do. He died in isolation excluded from his people, seemingly far from his father on that cross, all that he might provide us, the sick, our sick world with this antidote to the sin virus, that he might heal us 
and give us eternal life. That is the only message the world really needs to hear. It's the only message that can transform and give hope in the face of the ultimate questions of life and death. So go tell it. Don't be a silent disciple of Jesus anymore. The world needs to hear about the resurrection and the hope of a new creation. We have a gospel to tell, a substantial hope to give our neighbors and friends and community. And you can do that on the phone, on screen, as well as you can do it in a few months time by going to see someone and telling work colleagues. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then why not make this Easter Sunday your big, happy Easter day? The day when Jesus comes into your life, the one who's alive, because <laughs> you can't keep him out. No, no doors will lock Jesus out. He breaks through our imagination and our barriers and our skepticism and our doubts. And he comes to us to transform us with his truth and his love to give us that new start. Those of us who have denied him or betrayed him or gone silent about him. Jesus opens up to us the wonderful possibility that failure need not be final, that he has a job for us to do, that he has grace for us to receive from him. This Easter lockdown Sunday can be the day when God opens the doors of our lives to his truth in a very new way. Let's pray. Father, help us today, whoever we are, to find our peace in Christ. May Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, break through the doors of our suspicion and reveal his hands and sight to us. And speak his peace over our fearful lives and over our fearful world. And Lord, those of us who love Jesus, may we not be silent about him. May we go and tell and write the gospel, the ongoing story of God's love for the world and hope for that new creation. It's a glorious story, Father. Help us to live it and speak it. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
thanks so much for joining us here this morning and being a part of our Lansdowne Church online service. Uh, it's great that you were able to be with us and I really hope you found it helpful. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on in the life of the church, then, then please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and also to our Facebook page. And just a word to those who normally come to our physical services and use the offering at Woodbury Avenue. If you want to find out how to do that online, you can click a link at the side. But if you're our guest here this morning, we're so pleased you could be with us. Please don't feel like you need to do that at all. I really hope we'll see you again at 1030 next Sunday for our service here on our YouTube channel. And before we sign off, let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this glorious Easter Sunday morning. Thank you that it's a day where we can celebrate that Jesus is risen from the dead. When we are surrounded by so much fear, so much sickness and so much death at the moment. Thank you that Jesus has a life that cannot be extinguished. That he is alive today. And that if we put our trust in him, then we will share in his resurrection life. Lord, thank you that we have this glorious hope. Please help us to go from this service and share it with everyone we can. We pray this in the powerful name of King Jesus. Amen. Thank you.